well, Zach, this may sound kind of weird, but like, yeah. I'm kind of hearing that you're not really afraid of. I know it sounds weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on. You're not really afraid of death. I think what you're, what bothers you, it sounds to me, is actually your inability to deal with death. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Things have been, uh, they've been a little bit up and down, but, uh, it's been, I guess, all right. I mean, the new games are getting released that I'm excited to play. So that's at least one positive, right? Yeah. What, what are you looking forward to playing? Uh, Burning Crusade. Uh, unfortunately it's getting released a bit earlier than I would have ex hoped for. And uh, a few other games, Ashes of Creation, New World, other MMOs, basically. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, New World is um, Amazon Games' MMO? Yeah, yeah, it is. I'm excited to play that And when is that, that coming one. out? Uh, I actually don't know. I think it's August. Okay. okay. Is there like a beta or...? Yeah, there was. We played it for a while, and um, the game was fun for like three days, and it sucked. And so I'm hoping that when the game actually comes out, it'll be fun for at least five. Pretty much why not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's, it, it's gaming in 2021. What can I say? What is gaming in 2021? Uh, whenever they try to milk you out of all the money possible while simultaneously putting in the littlest amount of effort possible. Yeah, I was pretty excited about Magic Legends. I don't know if you tried yeah. playing Ooh. it. I, I didn't play it, but I played Magic the Gathering a lot whenever I was younger. So uh, yeah. I heard about it. Um, what did you hear? Uh, I, I just heard it was an ARPG. And I didn't hear any good or bad things about it. I just heard people said it came out, and then I never heard about it again. So you can kind of put two and two together there. And uh, yeah, yeah, I thought it was super cool. Like the the yeah. the conceptual des design behind the game, I was super excited uh -huh. about. Like the idea is that you've got like a deck, right? So it's sort of like a deck builder, but it's like yeah. in an ARPG format. So you can have like four skills at any given time. But once you use yeah. a card, you like lose the spell, and it goes back into your and then you have to like mm -hmm. reshuffle and stuff. So there's like a lot of deck building and stuff. So it seemed like a super cool ARPG. Um, I was uh, I was always hoping that like, I mean, I paid a lot of attention to magic like for many years whenever I played it. And I was in like high school and in the college. So like anytime that something cool like that happens, I'll kind of be interested in it. But I just kind of expected to hear more about it later. And I just never did. So, you know, that's usually the way it goes. Yeah, I heard that... Um, you know, I think what may have happened is there was like a, there's like, there were four classes and there's a fifth class that you can unlock. Um, but the, the class is only unlockable through microtransactions. And then uh, on top of wow. that, the microtransactions are RNG. So the class is a drop from a loot box. Oh. So people were, people were spending like $500 and still like not getting the class. See, that's uh, like I remember Apex Legends had something like that. And it was just like you, you got a little dagger for one of the characters. But like this is a whole class and it's $500. See, that's exactly the shit that I'm talking about, man. Like I, I said that uh, I said a game should make you want to waste your time and not just waste your time. And I feel like all the games now, they don't just waste your time. They waste your time and your money. It's just it's sad. Yeah, man. Yeah, I feel like the uh, I don't know, like maybe maybe it's like I'm getting older or something, but like the the allure to it and the smoke and mirrors behind the ways that they keep you playing the game are pretty much just mirrors now. You you can just <laughs> see right. It's just right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you said you're you're excited about Burning Crusade. Yeah, yeah. I like am. Wow. Classic Burning Crusade, right? Yep, yeah, that's right. And then you you've been playing a lot of Shadowlands recently, or yeah, yeah. How do you feel about Shadowlands? Not good. Uh, I feel like uh, you know I've I've played a game for fifteen years, and uh, the people that are running the game are ruining it, and I feel like I'm wasting my time playing it for the first time in like fifteen years. It's sad. How are it's they ruining sad. it? Uh, by just not knowing. I I don't think they're doing what I what I would do. I think they're just not really putting in the effort that they need to. I think they're just trying to kind of compel people to play the game longer rather than enjoy the game. Hmm. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I love your way with language, like compel versus enjoy. Yes, you know? yes. 
And then you said also that a game should make you want to waste your time, not yeah, waste it your shouldn't, time. Yeah, it shouldn't just waste your... Yeah, yeah, you yeah. want to spend all day playing the game, not you have to. Yeah. And that's the way it used to be. And, like, I always wonder, right, is, like, is this because I'm older? Is it because the game is worse? And I, it's, like, you can never really dissect the two because you can't, you know, experience them in, like, some sort of controlled environment. But it does feel a lot different than it, do, than it did. You can't experience them in a controlled environment. What? Um, yeah. Can, can you say a little bit more about that? Well, yeah, yeah. So, like, for example, if I go and I, I, I play a game that I used to play whenever I was a kid, I, I can't really go back and experience that for the first time. It's like the mm. you can never step in the same river twice, right? And it's kind of the same paradigm where if I go back and I play Super Mario World for the 800th time, it's not going to be the same experience as I had whenever I was five years old playing it and getting upset and mad because I couldn't beat the game. So it's like, is it because is the attachment to the games and the drive to play them diminishing because of the quality of the games? Or is it diminishing because of a different point in my life? You see what I mean? Yeah. I'm wondering yeah. if you're turning into a boomer. Me too. Right. right? <laughs> Me, too. Me too. Yeah. Right. Back in the day. Uh, back in my had... day, we didn't have any microtransactions. It was just the good times. You bought the game from Blockbuster and you took it home and you played it for three days. That's yeah. that's how it was for me, too. Let me tell you what. What happened is you'd go to a game and you'd purchase it. And Imagine the game, that. The game was yours. You didn't need none internet. No. To play it. It was, it was great. It really was. Yeah, I didn't need I to be... A single player game didn't need to be connected to their multiplayer server. I could just play it by myself when my cow stepped on my Ethernet cable. I could just keep playing. <gasps> what the hell's a battle pass? I never heard of that. Yeah, I know. I know all too damn well. It's sad. I don't know where it's gonna go. Yeah, man. But yeah, it might be it might just be being a boomer. I, I don't know. I think that's a that's a big part of it at least. Yeah, so I, I, I kind of feel that way too. Like, I wonder if it's the boomer yeah. within me. But I, I do feel like um, what's happening, kind of like what you, I think you captured it well, that a lot of game designers are trying to make a game that's com like, you know, that you're compelled to play as opposed to enjoyable yeah. to play. Um, can I just share like a bizarre experience I had like about a year ago? Absolutely. So I was at um, like a... So I, I used to be in Boston and, and sometimes I would go to like business networking events. Ooh. And, and so sometimes like at these business networking events, like, um, you know, you'd meet people who are like, you know, in different industries. And so like I met like this MBA who was interested in the gaming industry. He was like, yeah, like, I'm, okay. you know, I'm, I'm like, uh, I work in the gaming industry. And I was like, awesome. What games do you like? And he was like, oh, I don't, I don't like games. I don't play them. I was like, what interests you? And he, think, he was like, oh, like, you know, I think that the monetization opportunities are like really fantastic. And okay, I was like, right. no. I he, yeah, yeah. He works at Activision now. I, I, I know who that is. Yeah. Uh, and I, I know was like, I was like, this is, they actually exist. Like people are, and you know what it yeah. reminds me of actually is, is a, can I tell you another random story? I guess I'm the one telling stories sure. today. So when I was uh, training to become a psychiatrist, I, I, I had this eye-opening lecture from this just absolutely um, brilliant guy, and uh, his name is Dr. Freudenreich. And okay. so uh, we were we were talking about you know medicine and the practice of medicine within like medicine and healthcare. So you know I'm a doctor, I practice medicine, but in my job it's like healthcare. There's like a hospital, there's insurance, there's billing, there's administration, you know all this kind of stuff. And he's like, you know, if you don't like your job and you don't like healthcare, the problem is that, you know, 20 years ago, a hospital system had something called the forms committee. Can you imagine what the forms committee does? Uh, they probably process forms. Yes, absolutely. That, that's, that's literally it. Yeah. So they, wow. they pro okay. process forms and, and the committee actually makes the forms. So there's a group of people who decides what are the forms that people need to fill out. And when, when the forms committee was launched, they asked doctors to be a part of it. And can you imagine what the doctors said? No, please no. Absolutely. Please we hate, no. we hate yeah. paperwork. We hate it. 
I don't want to, I didn't go to medical school and train for seven years to become a neurosurgeon and devote over a decade of my life so I could figure out what forms need to be filled out. I did it to do neurosurgery on people with brain cancer. And so there were no doctors on the forms committee. And then the, then what happened is all these people decided which forms the neurosurgeon has to fill out. And then we lost the battle. And this is what's happening in the gaming industry yeah. now is that like, you know, we're, you know, we've got people who aren't gamers who are designing video games. That's just about right. Uh, it's P and, and they just necessitate a need for themselves because like if they, they'll always come out with new forms or new things that you have to do because they don't want to, you know, show how useless they are. I think that happens a lot too. It's like, they're kind of creating is creating a problem and then presenting themselves as a solution for it. And yeah. I think that happens with a lot of games too. How, can you share a little bit more about that? How do you, how do you know that? Uh, I mean, like it's a lot of things. I think that really like one example of this is like in, in the game, I play a lot world of Warcraft, like they will release like some sort of, you know, like let's say it's a way to get really good armor or to like make your legendary weapons or something like that. And you will have to repeat a process over and over and over in a way that is transparently just a method of extending your playtime rather than making you enjoy the content. So you do this over and over and over. And then later on, like maybe a year later, they will make it easier in the way that people initially wanted it to be one year ago. And mm. it's just, it's just crazy. Like it, and, and like it, it, as I said, it kind of lifts the, it, it pulls the curtain away and you can just see all the machinery in the back. It's like the, the wizard of Oz, right? You just see him in the, in the little room broadcasting and it's no longer this like experience that you have. The willing suspension of disbelief is removed and you're just stuck there like a, a rat in a maze. It yeah. sucks. It, it sounds terrifying. Are, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I feel like I got to share this. I'm hopeful, though. So I, I yeah. think like at the end of the day, like, I, I, did you play Hades? I played it for maybe 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I had fun for those 20 minutes, though. So, so I, I think Hades is a great example. Like, I absolutely love the game. And I think it's like yeah. an example. What what I'm terrified of is um, the AAA clones of Hades. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> they're coming. <laughs> Oh, no doubt. I mean, absolutely. And like the game, it's not like I stopped playing it because I didn't want to. I just stopped playing it because I, I had to go back to streaming and that that's why. And I haven't really had time to play it. But yeah, it was a really fun game. I enjoyed it. It was it was very clean. It was very well designed. And there's some things that are just kind of missing. Did you play Valheim? I kind of got the same experience oh, with that. Too. I love Valheim. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something made by five people. Right. And yeah. It just feels like, uh, you know, these big game companies, I, I told people that they're, uh, instead of too big to fail, it's too big to, to succeed. That's really the way I feel. It's like they're, it takes them forever to do anything. It's like overproduced and they have like this fixation on, you know, the lighting on a character's nose rather than the gameplay that everybody goes with. Yeah, I remember hearing about Dragon Age Origins 3. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you played the original Dragon Age, but the uh, uh, original Dragon Age. Oh, we just got a thousand dollar donation. Holy shit. What and it a seems God. like um, oh my God. As, as someone who struggles with mental health, what you're doing is invaluable. Thank you. <laughs> I was complaining about video games. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I, I don't know. So the funny thing now is like, yeah. I, I don't know if that person is talking about what we're talking about now. Yeah, it's just like a general statement. Yeah, or is it? Yeah. So now I'm genuinely confused whether, you know, talking about how depressing and predatory the video game landscape now is 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 yeah. like with the public good that we're doing, or is it when we talk about like depression and anxiety and and learning to love yourself? It's probably just it, it, it's like somebody is saying it besides them, and it's like okay, you know, there's a guy that graduated from Harvard who thinks the same damn thing that I did. I'm not crazy. You know, yeah. I think that's really what it is. I, I I remember every time that I hear somebody else saying what you're saying, it always is a little bit validating for me, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the support, folks. Yeah. Um, 
so, you know, just a couple other things. Like, I, I think that, like, you know, I hear what you're saying in terms of Activision being predatory and whatnot. But, like, yeah. part of the thing, though, uh, Asmund, is I, I still think that, like, these, these AAA game companies, like, actually make really amazing games. Like, I loved Warcraft 3, loved StarCraft. SC2 was, like, okay. Um, yeah. And, and, like, you know, WoW was amazing. I think Overwatch is, like, genuinely, like, a very good game. Um, mm-hmm. You know, people may disagree, but, like, I, I think a lot of the, you know, the big evil people actually do make really amazing games uh, i agree but i think that it's a very sad state of affairs that most of the examples that you gave were over 10 years ago you, but we'll say that i'm sure we'll say that about diablo yeah. immortal right won't we add that to the list um i i, I think that diablo more yeah I, that's a <laughs> that's a tough one isn't it that's a very tough one and like that's one of the things I just wish they made a, a a PC port for it. I'd play it if it was on the PC, just see what it's like. But um, I, they don't even do that for some reason. I have no idea why. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So w- are we just talking about? Are we like boomers well, it, reminiscing like, about the old? The- well, it's a metaphor, right? Because the games are like it's what I spend my time doing, and it's like. I played games all my life and I enjoy them and I don't really enjoy them as much now. And it's like, why is that? Is it because I'm older? Is it because the games are worse? It's, and that's what I meant. It's like hard to decide. It's like kind of like I'm 30 now. And I, I tell my, I say that all the time because I still can't even come to terms with it. It's scary. And I'm, I've done this for, like basically i've streamed and sat in my room all day every day and played video games for pretty much my whole adult life and i've loved it the whole time it's it's been absolutely amazing but it feels like it's coming to an end it feels like it's it's like ending in a way i don't know how i can really describe it it's sad can i just sit with that for a second yeah. You know, when you say that, what comes to mind? Have you played Dark Souls? Many times. So you know, like, the story behind Dark Souls, which is that the flame is going out. Yeah. That's sort of like the image that I get. Uh, yeah. I mean, I hope I don't end up like King Gwen, but yeah, I could see that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, and I think it's just also like I've kind of done you kind and of like, look like Gwen. <laughs> look, if I get a lot, if my hair keeps getting longer and I've gotten a few gray Beard. hairs, yeah, it's, it's getting there, man. It's getting there. <laughs> Asphalt. Oh Lord my god. Of Cinder. Yeah, that's right. I. Oh my god, that's scary to think. <laughs> and I did actually choose that ending too. Oh no. <laughs> so yeah i mean it's it's definitely scary because like i feel like i've done pretty much everything that i wanted to do and i've accomplished a lot of things i've wanted to do and it's like kind of i am aimless in a way because i don't have the same motivation to really do anything like i i do you know i go through the same motions and i do the same stuff but it's not with the same level of enthusiastic uh deterministic I, it's like determinism that i used to have it's just kind of i'm doing it because it's what i like doing and it's what i do it's not even really what i like doing it's what i do and it's weird for me to think back and think that it's been 10 years that i've been doing this and i don't i i don't ever want it to end but it is it's like i can't stop getting older i can't stop uh that this happening and i feel like also like i'm i'll be honest i'm sure you probably have had the same feeling like you ever play a game that you were really good at whenever you were a kid and now you suck at it yes yeah same. i've also done the opposite where there were games that i used to think were really hard and i go back and play them now and i was like i don't understand how i ever you know had difficulty with this game I, I understand that a lot. Yeah, it was a little bit of those too, especially some Super Nintendo games. I'm yeah. Like, you know, I was a dumbass kid. I had and, no idea what I was doing. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think the game that comes to mind the most is um, Dota. So I've been playing Dota for over a decade. 
And, All right. and like I was bad at Dota and then for a while I was like pretty good at Dota. Like I was probably like, you know, somewhere in the top 10 or 20 percent of the player base. Yeah. And then, you know, like respectable, like nowhere yeah. near pro, but like respectable. And now I'm <laughs> in like the bottom 50 percent. And and that. Yeah. And I've yeah. been one of these guys that like no matter what game, like, you know how there are like some people who are just good at games. Right. And like you can play, like, you can pick up any game. And within, you know, a month of playing it, you'll be, like, in the top 20% of the player base. Yeah. And then, yeah, like, I, there were always the noobs that you would prey on the, game after they game after game. game. Absolutely. You play, the, play those people for six months, they're going to just, they're never going to get better. Yep. And, and I, I feel, feel like I'm transitioning into that noob stage. Yeah, I, that's that's what yeah. I see. It's happening. Yeah, it's... In, uh, in Dota. It's, uh, yeah, so, and I... Go ahead. No, go out, go for it. Um, well, that's kind of the way that I feel, right? Is that it's like I feel like I'm losing that thing that I was I was good at, and I'm not good at it really that much anymore. And it's just kind of like for a lot of people, it's not it, like it wouldn't really matter, you know what I mean? Because it's just it's just a video game. But I think what really hits me hard with it is like thinking that it's like something as like a greater thing. Like if I'm just not good at the game anymore, it's whatever. But if I'm not good at the game anymore because I'm getting older, that's scary. What's scary about that? Because whenever you get older, you die. Is that what you feel like you're doing? Well, I mean, everybody is. You're doing it all the time. I mean, like, of course, to an extent, yeah. It just feels like... Uh, uh, it, it feels like I... Like there, there aren't really as many good things to look forward to anymore, if that makes sense. How long have you felt that way? I don't know, maybe three years, two years. And so it, it sounds to me like you're kind of living your life on autopilot. I mean, in a way, yeah. Or it's like kind of you're you're waiting for the next thing to go wrong. That's well, I, that caught me off guard. That's not what I was yeah. expecting you to say. What what do you mean you're waiting? Has a lot gone wrong? Yeah, I mean, well, it, it's not it's not something that just happens overnight. Uh, it, it's just something that kind of it's a, it's either like a slow deterioration, or it could be something that just kind of happens, right? Of course, and it's one of those things where it's kind of hard to pinpoint when it happens. But if you go back and you look two years like before, like in in the past, you'd see that things are clearly better. And there was no real day where things changed, but it was just like a slow decay. Yeah, that sounds bleak. How how were things for you? How how were things for you three years ago? Uh, probably uh, a l little bit better, right? I mean, I had a classic WoW to look forward to. Uh, that was cool. And um, then uh, I mean, it's like a lot of little things, right? Because back then I was like really excited about uh doing my stream and and being very successful with my stream and I, I still care about that a lot but like at that time i didn't i never had the success that i have now so it wasn't like i still had that to work towards if that makes sense mm -hmm. so it seems and, like you you had a goal yeah i had a goal I, I have no goals um like i have like i guess i mean to an extent i do but the goals that i used to always have like this might sound insane okay but I used to honestly wake up in the morning and feel completely like fulfilled and satisfied with the idea that I'm going to play World of Warcraft today and I'm going to farm for some item that I want and I'm going to feel great about it. And I'm going to go to bed that night and I'm going to feel like a winner. And I used to really feel that way. It was great. And now it's just not the same. How do you feel now? Like I wasted my damn time. Like that's that's the way I feel. It's always my. I feel like I don't know what to what to do. Uh, I, I don't know if I like what what it is. And I've tried to find like other things. Uh, I made an org uh, company with people, uh, friends of mine, and that's gone really well. It's gone actually surprisingly well, and uh, that's been great. But there needs to be something for me personally that I have to work towards. Can you tell me about the org? Yeah, uh, basically, I, I made a, an organization called uh, OTK, One True King, with uh, myself, uh, S-Fan, you know, S-Fan, Mizkiff, uh, T, 
tips out and my other friend Rich. Uh, we brought on Nick Pollum, uh, NMP as well. And uh, we have people that we obviously hire and we put on different events and we just kind of make content together. Oh, interesting. It stands for One True yeah. King? One True King, yeah. I just I thought it was One Turn Kill. Um, so <laughs> we actually, uh, the funny thing about that is uh, we actually found out it also stands for Over the Knee, which is a sexual fetish. We didn't know that until after we announced the org. Okay. Little, cool. uh, little fun, uh, fun little excitement. What is it? Thing there. Rule 42? I think anything can be. 32. Yes. 32. Anything yes, can be a sexual right. fetish, right? Um, yeah. I, we actually thought about as a joke selling paddles. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. But yeah, it's, uh, it, I, I think that was like, that's kind of like a next step thing for me too, right? Is to kind of have that thing that you can kind of work on beyond just playing video games and, and beyond that something that's kind of bigger than yourself and uh that that has been it, it's been very stressful for me to have to do that and um especially as somebody who is uh pretty much a hermit i like being alone all the time and now i have to talk to people all the time for those different things and it's it's good but it's also exhausting for a person who likes to be alone you want me to call you asmund gold asmund or or what? Oh, Zach? Just, or... We just do Zach. It's fine. Okay. Zach, can I have a second to think? Yeah, sure. Um, do you mind if I ask you a... I'm just debating this because there's something that my mind is curious about. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering if maybe like asking this question is embarrassing. Uh, I was debating maybe asking it to you in private, but it's something that you had publicly spoken about on stream before. And I find myself kind of wondering. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, did you ever go see that dentist and get your teeth taken care of? Yeah, uh, I did. I still need to get more of them taken care of. Absolutely. Uh, it takes me uh, like my teeth are fucked up. Right. And so there's a lot of work that I need to have done. And, uh, with, with COVID and everything, I have been a little bit slower on doing it, but yes, I've had a number of my teeth, uh, fixed and taken care of. Uh, now I have to do, I think probably two or three more visits. How but do you like, feel you about could, that? Uh, well, there's a funny thing about that. So whenever I was younger, I used to always eat my food really fast and then it would make me sick to my stomach because I ate my food so fast. And then all my teeth fell out and I couldn't do it anymore. And I stopped getting sick after eating my food. And now that I got my teeth back, I'm eating my food again and I'm getting sick again. <laughs> so wow, uh, it, yeah, that's basically where we're at. And uh, I, I, there's, I don't know, there, I don't know if there's really a moral to that story or anything like that, but it's basically, uh, it, it's basically what it is. And it, it's not like I, it's not like an eating disorder. I just eat food very fast, right? I just want to eat the food. Like, Eating food is like a, it's like a daily quest in a video game where like, I just want to get it out of the way as fast as I can. So I can move on to actually playing daily quests in video games. <laughs> that's basically that's, it. That's nice. Yeah. Get my, get my RL daily quests out of the way so that yeah, I can do just, my virtual dailies. Yeah. I'm in max it and, uh, you know, sometimes it, it, it doesn't turn out very well, but yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I do, I, I do. I'm glad that I've. I've gotten them fixed more and uh, it's kind of, it was really bad. Like there were a few times where I stopped streaming because one of my teeth uh, broke or fell out or something like that. Uh, and you could tell whenever I was streaming and it just kind of, there are a lot of things that I have no problem with people looking at me and seeing, but that was one of them that was just a little bit too much. Okay. So I'm going to just kind of think out loud for a second because yeah. I'm noticing you know, potentially a direction of this conversation that's a little bit aligned okay. with what we usually do. So I know we yeah. started talking about, about like, you know, gaming and, and being, yeah. you know, boomers and back in the day, like, you know, you had back in the day, like you didn't have a server that gave you matchmaking. You had to go out and find your match yourself. You, you had, had to, to make a, you had to make friends. Yeah. And it was to, great. It was you had to create a custom lobby and you never knew who would show up and whether they would be a hacker. And there was no, yeah. there was no reporting system for hackers. Xbox to, Live didn't give a shit. Yeah. Yeah. I remember so, it all too well. 
So we kind of started out there, and I'm, I'm noticing that you're someone who's quite driven and that you used to look forward to the day. Like you'd wake up and you'd play WoW and you'd really yeah. enjoy it. And it was like it was an exciting and fulfilling life. You were also somewhat, you know, skilled or lucky and became like, you know, successful through that. Um, yeah. And and then like, and then just like in, in the world of Dark Souls, like, you know, there's only a limited amount of fuel. And, yeah. And, and the flame starts to dim. And then like now what I'm kind of hearing from you is like, you don't have goals. Like you don't have that zest that used to drive you. And well, there's, Yeah. I was going to say, there's nothing really to look forward to in the yep. same way that there used to be. So, um, great point. I'll, I'll kind of get to that in a second. Um, so, so, and then like you even tried stuff, right? Like you've heard from the others that, oh, if you're like tired of gaming, gaming, like make an org, like do something else, like set, like come up with a new goal for yourself. And you're yeah. like, cool, let's do this. And then the interesting thing is that what I'm hearing you say is that it actually checked a lot of the boxes. Yeah. It, it gave you something to work towards, working towards success. It sounds like it's actually fun, but there's still yeah. something like missing. It's sort of like, you know, it's, it's kind of like a puff pastry. That's kind of good, but like empty on the inside. Yeah. It's like, it's like an eclair and there's no cream in the middle. Yeah. Right. And, and so, and so th this is where I, I think like maybe what we need to, uh, oh, oh, we're getting donations. Sorry. Um, I, I think what we want to talk about today is like goals and the nature of fulfillment. Yeah. And, and I'm also curious, are you afraid of dying? Yes. Yes. Very much so. Very, okay. very much so. It, it's, uh, it's the same as like the uh the the gray hairs or you know i go get gray hairs it's like the memento mori of it and it i i, I have to I, I pull them out of my beard i cut them out of my beard because it just freaks me out it totally freaks me out and like i i'm so scared of it okay Absolutely. so i i think we can we can this is something i can work with yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, Zach, I'm, I'm, I'm actually like, I feel pretty good that that this is something that you can overcome. <laughs> like, I, I know, I know. The, so, the best way that I've I've been able to overcome it is by reminding myself that I'm just a very intelligent monkey, and I have no idea how the world and the fucking the inner workings of the universe really exist, right? Like, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Just sit back, shut up, and enjoy the ride. Like, that's been the best way that I've learned to cope with it. Yeah, so what? that sounds like a good coping mechanism, but it yeah. sounds like a coping mechanism, not a fix. Okay. So there's a part of me that says, like, why not just learn how the universe works? Because you, I, I don't think you can pierce the veil. I don't. I don't think people can. I, I. I don't think it's possible. It's the same as like I don't think a, uh, you know how like an ant couldn't learn physics. I don't think people can do it. Uh, and I think that's a completely reasonable experience. I mean, a, a, yeah. a, a completely reasonable view. And I think that you know you're not going to understand that people can pierce the veil until you pierce the veil. Yeah. Um. I mean, I guess that's a good way to say it. I mean, people didn't know there was fire until they made fire. They didn't know there was electricity until that happened. Yeah. And so this is where I, I think the interesting thing is historically. So I think the problem is that where you are. Yeah. Many people have been historically. And this is where my confidence comes from is because I think that like, you know, you have a lot of the features that I'm going to out, outline in a second that I think are, you know, you're really falling into a pattern here. Can I just keep talking? Yes. So the first is that a lot of times excitement and motivation come from goals, especially for young yeah. people, right? Like, so I, I, like I, I set a goal for myself. I want to be something. I want to accomplish something. And so you climb to the top of the mountain and it's, it's the image of the view at the top of the mountain, which motivates you to climb. Yeah. And so this is the most natural form of like motivation and like goal setting and excitement. Like you were building something, you were growing, you were playing games, you were loving it. Yeah. And then you reach to the, the top of the mountain. And even then the, the view at the top of the mountain is glorious. 
But now right. what? Right? And so this well, is where... Yeah. It's like you're slowly sliding down the side of the mountain and every once in a while you stop sliding and you sh you you trick yourself and tell yourself that it's a win but the fact is is that you're just losing slower yeah man so like i don't know how to say this to you but as long as that image and that experience is there i think yeah. it's going to be very hard to find excitement yeah I, I i would say so right so here's what i'm hearing i think sliding down the mountain is a good you seem like you wanted to say something go for it well, I, I think that it, it's more that it's not just a metaphor for gaming. It's like, I think whenever you're younger, right, you look forward to um, you look forward to maybe getting your first girlfriend, uh, you know, getting a car, learning how to drive, uh, going to college, you, you know, like moving out or, you know, a bunch of these different firsts. And I feel like all of the fun firsts that I've that I have are pretty much over with. And I'm just kind of. Uh, I, I'm I'm waiting for the bad first to happen. And it's like, I, I really only have bad things to look forward to for the rest of my life in a way. I, it sounds really bleak, but that's really how I feel. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you're sharing that because I, I think it's yeah. bleak and also it's reasonable. And here's yeah. the reason it's reasonable because so far fulfillment from you has come from cresting the mountain, right? And so like, here's what I'm hearing is like, there's an uphill part and once we get yeah. to the top it doesn't matter whether you're facing north south east or west there's only one way to go that sure is yeah right and and so what i'm hearing from you is this sort of like the fire is going out a fear of, of mortality if you actually study like psychoanalysis what you'll find is that dreams around dental problems are associated with the fear of death I don't blame him. <laughs> I don't blame him at all. I, I think it's more about like, it's not about, it's how to transcend the mountain entirely. Because yes. like, I, I don't, yeah, you, you can't, the thing is, I know that you can't live your life. It's like, you have to, you can't be, uh, I guess like goal, like outcome uh, driven, right? You have to just be able to do something because you enjoy doing it. And yeah, that's, so the, that's the goal. Yeah, so so that's where when you say transcend the mountain, the reason that I'm actually optimistic yeah. is I think there are a couple of different things going on. One is that I see this a lot because I, I work with some very successful people, and success drives them to the top, but then they shrug their they're like, now what? Right? And what they usually end up doing is much like yourself, they're like, Oh, it's climbing to the top of a mountain, which gives me a yeah. sense of fulfillment. So let me go find another mountain. And then they climb that one and they get like a diminishing return from it. It checks some of the boxes and they're like, oh, I've accomplished stuff. I can, I feel pride, but I still feel unfulfilled. It's not the same. Yeah. And so they'll find mountain after mountain after mountain and they'll feel unfulfilled despite being successful, successful, successful. It doesn't and matter. They, yep. And so the reason that yeah. I'm optimistic though is because like the best known case of someone solving this problem is Buddha. So okay. we talked about Buddha. Okay. Like if you and I talked about him? No, no, I I know a, a bit, but can not. You tell, uh, can you share with us what you know about Buddha? Uh, basically, I think that he was some sort of a like some sort of workman, and then he kind of just sat under a tree, and pretty much all of the a lot of the revelation that he had, I I believe, was just kind of internal, and I think that the I, I remember there was I think some sort of a a, a phrase where the true enlightenment is not you know understanding the complexities of the universe it's understanding the nothingness of the universe or something like that i think it's like a one of the things about that now i could be getting this completely wrong and this is like 10 years ago or 15 years ago but it's it, that's what i remember yeah that's actually it, you hit all the important parts but a couple of details i think we're gonna have to reshift so yeah. like uh, i think uh, uh, the key thing is that what buddha did was as you put it pierce the veil yeah okay so okay. Right. So like, I think that's what his discovery was, is that like you can climb mountains until the end of time, but mm -hmm. that external fulfillment is going to come with diminishing returns and you can keep on chasing yeah. new things. You can like, okay, I'm going to start a company. I'm going to become a streamer. I'm going to have kids. You can, you can find all these mountains to climb, but that if we kind of think about it fundamentally, like if you're unsatisfied at the top of a mountain, like 
that's a temporary satisfaction. And climbing mountains is, will always lead to temporary satisfactions. And so what Buddha discovered is like through a lot of internal work, which is exactly correct. I mean, I think you hit a lot of the key points, which is that you can climb mountains until you're out of breath, but never will that bring you peace. That peace is uh, piercing the veil is not about looking at a telescope. It's about looking at a mirror. Yeah. And so I think the journey that you have to walk is, is this one. And we can kind of talk. About, so I think that's like the fundamental of where you are. And then I think there's also kind of a psychological component, fear of death, thing like that, that needs to be processed. But there are a yeah. couple of um, different uh, uh, key points that I want to share. The first is that Buddha wasn't a workman. He was a okay. prince. And so what oh, happened is yeah. materialistically, he climbed to the top of the highest mountain. So people told him like, hey, like as a, you know, as a prince, like these are the things that you should accomplish. And he went and he did those. And then like, you know, he got married. He had a healthy son. He was revered. He was wealthy. He was powerful. He was respected. He was loved. He had a bright future. And one day he woke up and even though he was the envy of the world, he was unhappy. And so then he was like actually screwed because there's a there's a subtle thing, uh, uh, Zach, which makes things both beautiful. You're you're blessed and cursed because when someone who is not successful wakes up and feels unhappy, what do they think will lead them to happiness? Well, they think the success will. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, they right? they know what the problem is and they have a, a thing that they can displace their uh, unhappiness onto. But whenever you have what you want and then you still don't feel the way you want, it's harder to deal with that. Absolutely. So at some point, you reach the end of the road, right? And yeah. the, the worse my life is, the further I can go, like repairing things, repairing things, repairing things, you know, like playing games, fixing your teeth, launching an organization. You kind of tried your hand at a couple things. You're taking care of business. You're continuing yeah. to be successful. And yet... Once we get to kind of the top, then we begin to realize we're like faced with this problem, which is like, where does happiness come from? And this is the really, really crazy thing. If you look at the, the Hindu and Buddhist traditions, I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with this. I'm going to go into a little bit of history lesson. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. I mean, I actually, there's a, a story that I, I remember I, I heard, and it was a, a guy that kind of ascended to some degree of, uh, you know, pseudo heaven and he was assigned an architect, and this is, I think, part of Hindu mythology. And the architect, uh, you know, he kept wanting to big, bigger and builder, like bigger and bigger castles. And finally, like the architect was so tired of it that he went and he asked, I think it was Brahma or, or Vishnu, I forgot which one. And he's like, how can I get this guy to stop wanting bigger and bigger castles? And then the, the god told him, he's like, I'll, this is no problem, I'll solve it. And then the guy had the castle built and then a bunch of ants marched in to the castle and each one of the different ants was a former version of himself and it put in perspective how actually meaningless and, and how how little it, it really mattered hmm. and i forgot i forgot what his name was yeah uh, yeah i that's not a particular story i'm i'm that familiar with so i i, I don't remember his name but um, I think there's kind of an interesting principle, which is like, if you yeah. look at all the people, so you're, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, because it sounds like you've studied, you know, Hindu mythology or something, or you're just well read, maybe. A, a, a bit. I, it's just, well, it's a story that I think it, it, it made an impact on me. And because it just, it kind of puts into perspective that like, it's the whole idea of, you know, Ozymandias or anything like mm -hmm. that, where any accomplishment that you have is always fleeting. Absolutely. So, so here's an interesting um, thing. So, you know, you know, like in India, there were four castes. There was a caste system. Yes. And the highest caste were the Brahmins, the priests. Mm -hmm. These were the teachers of meditation, the closest to God, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they were like, they were like, they were the, you know, they, they taught meditation. Below yeah. them were the Kshatriyas or the nobility. And these were kings, lords, et cetera. Below them were the Vaishnavs, uh, who were, uh, uh, Vaishyas, sorry, who were uh, the merchant class. And below them were the Shudras or the laborer caste. And so let me ask you a question. Which caste do you think produces the most enlightened people? 
Um, probably it's kind of hard to say. I mean, it depends on like what you mean by enlightenment. I mean, obviously you would have the Brahmins and they're the ones that spend all of their time uh, working towards enlightenment. So that's what would, would make a lot of sense. But is that really what's, what's true? Because usually, I mean, isn't that just kind of hereditary, what caste you end up in? Sure. So, but they're also trained formally in the, in the skills of meditation, right? They're the ones that yeah. are the teachers and the experts. And I don't know. I so it turns out that it's the Kshatriyas. Okay. So consistently, like if you think about the incarnations of Vishnu, which if you want to think about it, like not from a religious standpoint, but a historical or anthropological standpoint, yeah. I think what you can safely assume is that sometimes there have been historical human beings that have been like different to the point where like they leave a legacy that people assign divinity to. Like Rasputin. Right? <laughs> Almost. Like I mean that that's a that's a borderline one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I, yeah. I I think it's it's a good it's a funny example, but possibly yeah. So what I'm thinking about is like if you look at all the enlightened beings from the Indian subcontinent, they're all kings. Yeah, things like that. And and the question okay. is like why is that? If you have the experts in meditation, you have the teachers in meditation, and they what the the Brahmin does is goes to the king's palace every day, teaches the king how to meditate, and then goes home. Why is it that the king gets enlightened before the Brahmin does, inconsistently so? And the really interesting answer is because, like, you know, I, I think it comes back to climbing to the top of the hill. Because at the <laughs> end of the day, what the Brahmin is taught is that, like, don't climb to the top of the mountain because that's not your job. The top of the mountain will never give you fulfillment. So the Brahmin never climbs to the top. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they travel to the king's palace every single day and they see a bigger house. And, you know, the king has a prettier wife and, you know, like the, you know, there, there's all these like, like the king eats finer food and has finer clothing. And the king is the one who actually winds up at the top of the mountain. The king is the one who wakes up one day and finds like this desperation of unhappiness. Because remember, like we talked about, when your yeah. life is not perfect, you chase an external goal. So for the Brahmins, there's this seed of desire that is never fulfilled. And as long as that seed of desire is never fulfilled, they can never truly seek enlightenment because the search, the road for enlightenment, people, people make it sound like it's like a positive thing. That it's like, if you look at Instagram accounts about like people who are deeply spiritual, it's all like, you know, like being in touch with the universe and like, oh my God, I'm so like in love, like learn to love, man. Yeah. Like, I love myself in a new way. Those guys don't get it. The road to enlightenment starts with, what you feel every single day is that like a no matter what you do like things are decaying and no matter like what you accomplish like it that excitement can never be reproduced yeah that that's kind of what's so uh, it, it's very bittersweet in a way because like you can appreciate it and you can also resent it or uh dislike it or be afraid of it and you kind of have the, the duality that happens all the time. Yeah, so that's actually, that understanding is one of the key things to transcend duality. You have to sit within duality constantly to ultimately recognize that things are neither bitter nor sweet. Right? So when you kind of talked about, you said something about like nothingness when you were talking yeah. about your understanding of Buddha's um, enlightenment. And yeah. I think one of the key discoveries is that, like, there is no such thing as growth and there is no such thing as decay. And once you recognize that, once you realize that, you'll be free from your sense of decay. I feel like, uh, like, yeah, it's like the most enlightened version of it is what it is. I, I, I get it. I understand it. But I, how is that real if, if people die? Like a, tre a tree dies, it, it burns up, tree's gone. How's that not decay? Yeah, so so I could give you a logical answer that yeah. it isn't decay. Um, I, 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 could, I could do that, but I think that will be a discussion of logic, and that's not actually going to like let you transcend the mountain. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, the, the answer that I would give you is, is all kinds of things. One is like, you know, that matter, energy, and Transform. consciousness are just transformed. Yeah. Right. So like like it is is a st uh, is a chunk of limestone 
better or worse than like a brick in a house. I think it's like the uh, the impact that it has on you, right? So like, of course, obviously, it's all the same in the grand scheme of things, right? In the grand order of the of the universe, but you know, to a person and to like what your experiences are, there are of course things that have more importance to you than other things. It's like a so, uh, you know, family member is more important than a rock, even though now now we get to the crux of it, right? So well yeah. said. The impact on you. So this is what the yogis discovered is that, like you said, it's internal. So like the battle that you need to fight has nothing to do with climbing mountains. It has mm -hmm. everything to do with understanding how to essentially control or be free of things impacting you. To be able to join a microtransaction cesspit the same amount is your first like enjoyment of wow to understand yeah. that like living in life is like it's all about impact in the sanskrit word for de-impaction essentially training yourself to be free from the impact of things is vairagya to be free of like it's detachment is the the best kind of uh definition of it um and, and so like this is a process that like you can undergo to where you know, like you can like literally learn how to transcend the mountain that the going up the mountain and going down the mountain is not actually like any different. Uh, I know. I, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it feels a lot different. I'll say that. Yep. It and, feels and, a whole lot. different. So but but that's the key thing, right? Is like like yeah. the, the difference arises of feeling. It mm -hmm. arises to your attachment or your valuing of the yeah. climb over the descent. Yeah, but how, how could you possibly equate the two? That's what I, I don't understand. It's like it, it it's like I, I try to rationalize it in my own mind a lot where it's like you just go on. It's like for like for streaming, for example, right? You go on, you have a great stream, you go on, you have another stream and it's not good. Like, how can you? make both of those feel as good to you personally and like i think the answer that i always tell myself is that well you have to enjoy them both and you have to just kind of get the same thing out of them but it feels like that doesn't really happen for me okay so i'm gonna give you one last logical answer and then we're gonna okay. get into it okay yeah all right so here's the thing so so i think you learn this in medicine so okay. like sometimes you work with a patient and they live. And sometimes you work with a patient and they die. Yeah. Right? So like clearly one is better than the other. There's like no objective argument that can be made. And yet, do you imagine that it's possible for a doctor to go to work every day and actually like be just as satisfied with their life, whether the patient lives or dies? Uh, I don't think so. I think that there are a lot of doctors that probably if they have a patient die, they'll feel terrible about it. I would mm -hmm. expect so. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here's where, what my experience has been is that ultimately I can't control whether a patient lives or dies. And it's been really bizarre. I'm thinking of one particular patient in residency that had like younger guy, um, you know, maybe in his like er, er, early to mid fifties. Um, had liver cancer, but like one of the sort of genetic or other variants, like it's not like he was drinking alcohol and did something yeah. that was responsible for the cancer. Just, uh, you know, so, so he was a, he was a, um, a Chinese gentleman. And, and so I was kind of assigned to him because I speak a little bit of Mandarin and like, we didn't have Mandarin okay. translators. And so like, I was assigned to him because like, I could at least ask him like if he had pain that day. And so, you know, working with his family was really interesting. He had like a 17 year old son. And, um, you know, it was really like eye opening because like, it's clear that the dude is going to die. And, and yet like, like it, it's so hard to describe. I think this is where you have to really experience it, but sort of like coming to terms with the fact that as a human being, like I can't, I can't cure him of his cancer. Like I can't do that as a doctor. You can't actually save someone's life. All you can do is like try. Right. Yeah. And, and there comes a point where like, you can, a patient can survive and you can have done a shitty job as a doctor and a patient 
can have died and you could have done an amazing do- job as a doctor. And that ultimately, like, what where my peace comes from is, like, is devoting myself to, like, the action that I take as opposed mm-hmm. to, like, what happens to the patient. Because there's no question that, you know, life is better than death, at least in a medical setting, right? But yeah. it's just, it's sort of like, you know, what I, where I find my peace, and I know this may sound strange to you, Zach, and we'll, we'll get you there, you know, because I, I think I have the benefit of some of these experiences where you, like, grapple with, like, people dying of cancer, and you figure out, how can I go on? How can I, you know, can I be proud of what I did? And, and there are times where, like, when I think about that, that patient and my work with that patient, that is, I think, like, the height of what I've been capable of. Yeah, being right? attached to an outcome. And being detached, being detached. From yeah, the yeah, that, that's, you know, that's, yeah, being attached is the problem and being detached is the goal. Yeah. And, and so like, like, can you see how objectively, like, there's no question that life is better than death. But even yeah. like, to this day, the family is incredibly grateful that I was this person's doctor. I'm incredibly grateful for having the experience, even though the dude died, and it was sad. That there's an axis of suffering and contentment that is actually independent of happiness and sadness. Okay. Okay. I can see that. Yeah. Right? And, and I think you may understand that part pretty well because I think that there are a lot of reasons that you... There's a lot of joy, enjoyment, and potential happiness in your day-to-day. There's accomplishment. There's hopefully laughter. You know, there's <laughs> working with your one true king folks. And there's something that's like missing on the inside, despite everything going so well. Yeah, exactly. So that axis is like the path that you have to walk through spirituality because you figured out how to like become successful. That's the first axis. And what happens, the reason we get stuck is because we think that the axis of success and the axis of contentment are linked because early yeah. on in life, as we climb that mountain, we think that these two things are linked because they grow together. And then you yeah. you kind of like you're going up together. And then what happens is you get to the top of the mountain. And then some people realize that the axes are truly perpendicular. And when you understand that 100% is when you attain enlightenment. Yeah, I, I've tried so hard. And like, I, I've just, I, I, in a way, like, it's something that you can clearly know. But knowing it isn't the same as living it. I with you, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. It's like I, so, you, you want to do that, and you want to transcend being outcome like, de, like outcome driven or outcome determined or whatever, right? But you just can't get out of it. Like I, yeah. it's like I'll play a game, and I'll be like, oh, even if I don't beat the boss, even if I don't do something, it's, it's fine. And then I play it, and I don't beat the boss, and I'm, I'm molding. Yep. So, so now. <laughs> So enough of theory. Yeah. Because I think there's something holding you back. Okay? Yeah. And and so this is where I think that, like, there's that general principle, but I think there's one big thing getting in the way, which is your fear of death. So this, I think, think is actually, like, psychological in nature. It's of the mind. Okay. Um, and, And so as long as you... We have to get to and probably process or dissolve this sense of decay that, like, plagues you right so that like what i'm sort of getting the sense of is like you have this shadow that goes like that accompanies you through all of your things and the shadow is like this feeling that like we're on the decline that there's a sense of decay that joy like the only firsts that i have left are bad ones yeah you know exactly and and so that comes from somewhere that has nothing to do with the axis of contentment or suffering what that has to do with is like a psychological, like, because, and this is where we can lean on neuroscience a little bit. Just think about this for a second, Zach. Like, you literally have neurons that have been wired to produce those thoughts. Yeah. Right? So then the question becomes, how did those neurons get wired that way? And how can we change your neuronal wiring? So this is now taking a step. We're going to leave spirituality behind. Forget about spirituality, forget about enlightenment, forget about the top of the mountain. And what we really have to do for you is do some psychological work and rewire some of your neurons. Because once that happens, then you can walk that other axis of contentment and suffering. So let me ask you this. Uh, Does that make sense? 
Yeah, no, it, it definitely makes sense. It, it's basically it's it's programmed in the wrong way. Like you're, yep. you're programmed to think one thing, and and it it's a bad thing to think. Yeah, I, I totally understand. S- sort of. So the the tricky thing is that it it's programmed. It was programmed in the right way, and now it's maladaptive. Yeah. So it's not a mistake. It's actually. And, and so let me ask you this: How long have you been afraid of death? Since I found out about it. Can you tell me about that? How you found out about that? Uh, I don't really remember, honestly. Uh, I was, I, I think the earliest memory I have is uh, I was like, I don't know, like four or five or six, right? Uh-huh. But I, I got, uh, you know, I was raised Roman Catholic. And so I had a lot of experience just kind of talking about the whole idea of afterlife and everything like that. And even whenever I was like five years old, I, I, I read some of the stories. I heard some of the stories in the Bible. And I was like, man, I never heard of anybody that lived in a fish. I don't even know if this is true. And it, it made me wonder, it's like, what is the, uh, w- what's really going on and what's really going to happen? Because like, yeah, I understand people die and I was scared of it. I remember, uh, you know, it's like you can run from it, hide from it. Uh, destiny comes all the same. And um, it it's scary. It is. And I remember thinking that when I was a little kid and there have been times where I've been able to kind of forget about that. And I think that's really kind of always been my goal is to just not think about it. And I think that sometimes never I, I don't. This sounds like really stupid because I, I think it in a way I, I feel stupid for thinking this way. And um, like I will I will do badly in a game sometimes and it will remind me that I'm getting older and I'm going to die because I'm not as good as I feel like I used to be. And it's like this weird, like kind of domino effect where like playing a game like that will make me feel this way. And it's just so like, to me, I I, I find it embarrassing. It's, it's weird because I, I think it's a, um, it's like a, a illogical conclusion in a way, but in another way, it's not. Yeah. So well said. So, so I, I think, when you say it's an illogical conclusion, here's what I'm, I'm going to rephrase that a little bit or transform yeah. it. Okay. What I'm, what I'm going to, the way I'm going to interpret that is that if you look at the variables that lead you to playing a crappy game of whatever, there are tons of them, right? Yeah. If you're a, if you're a MOBA player, the number one variable is that your team sucks. Absolutely. It's always their fault. Yep. And, and so like, if we think about it, there are a thousand reasons why, you know, you you have poor performance in the game. Yeah. But what your mind jumps to is ah, see this is a sign of the decay. We knew it was there. We know it's coming. As you said, you can't escape it. It's destiny. Here it is. And and so this is this is the, the very nature of a cognitive bias is that like it's a filter through which an independent experience become like transforms into something else. Yeah, it's like uh, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Absolutely. You find it, yeah, I, I get it. So, so, so now we go back to, I mean, you say you don't have mem- many memories about it, but like, like I think that we have to figure out how to deconstruct the filter. And that, that starts with like understanding how the filter was built. And so when yeah. you were four years old and you were like raised Roman Catholic, and when you say, can yeah. you tell us more about that? Well, uh, I went to church every Sunday, got communion. I never liked going to church, couldn't play Game Boy in church. And uh, I didn't really ever believe in a lot of this stuff. I thought it was kind of, I, I, in a way, there's like the parallel realities of, is it more, like, I think I even said this last time I was on here, is it more terrifying to know that you are created just for this endless cycle of servitude towards some deity that you don't really fully comprehend or is it more terrifying that you're just a hyper intelligent ape with no purpose in life who's going to die and can cease to exist in a period of time that's nothing in the grand scheme of things it's like which one of these realities is more terrifying and i think they're both pretty bad yeah so that sounds like philosophy to me yeah yeah i mean a lot of the you know, religion in a lot of ways is philosophy. And so, what? yep. So I'm going to steer away from that. Go ahead. So why did you have to go to church? Well, my mom wanted me to. It was Sunday. And can you help me understand what 
did you did you ever try to tell your mom that you didn't want to go to church yes i, I made her aware of the way that i felt about it yes many times can, can you tell us about that I was like, mom, I don't want to go. She's like, it's too bad. You're going to go. And I was like, well, I don't want to go. And then finally, sometimes I would uh, try to make myself feel better and think like, maybe she'll take me to Burger King after church. That was that honestly, sometimes that helped. But um, overall, like, yeah, like she would always make me want to go or make me go. And I didn't really like nowadays, the weird thing about it is nowadays, I, I you know, I, I offer every time that it's like a holiday, like right now, you know, COVID. So like, I'm not doing it, but like any other time besides, and I always tell her like, listen, mom, if you want if you want me to take you to church, I will not even stream. Like I will make sure that you get to go to church. Right. Because I knew how much it meant to her back then. But whenever I was a kid, I didn't have that same perspective. Right. And so back then I just, uh, you know, I didn't want to go. I hated going. And it was just, it's like, I could be at home playing with my friends. I could be playing video games. I could be doing something that I want to do. And instead I'm doing this thing that I don't want to do that. I don't even think is real. Okay. And what would she say when you told her that you didn't want to go? Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of different things she'd say, but, um, like, I, I don't the thing is it's it's odd because I don't even really remember like the only thing I really remember is that it didn't matter yep yeah I could rationalize it all I wanted but uh I was, yep. I was still still driving to church yep so inevitable it's nothing inevitable you, nothing you can do to escape it well I could like fake sick sometimes I fake sick there's a few times I did that but uh, other than that, yeah, it's pretty much inevitable. Now, are we talking about going to church or dying? Uh, definitely church. I feel like the, I, I definitely feel like it's two kind of different things because church, like I was like, I knew that at some point I wouldn't have to always do this. And like, I could get away from it to an extent because it's like, okay, well, I'm clearly not going to be nine years old forever. So eventually I won't have to deal with this. But um, with, with dying, you can't really get away from it in the same way. At so least not let yet. me ask you a question, okay? So yeah. I, I understand that you don't remember exactly what the conversations were, but yeah. you remember the feeling, right? Uh -huh. Of being dragged to church. Yeah. So like, like there's a certain sense of like powerlessness and inevitability to the story that you're telling. No, I mean, I think every kid has like many stories like that where you just have to do something. It's like going to school. It's the same we're not, thing. We're not. Okay. If it's the same thing for you, but let's not worry about what, what many kids have. Okay. So here's my question. I know it's going to sound kind of weird. Yeah. When you have those thoughts of decay, is the quality flavor or color of emotion that you experience at all similar to how you felt when you got dragged to church? Not really. I mean, I think the church thing was just a more OS, a, a, you know, a one and a half hour inconvenience, whereas okay. dying is like a very much, it's a much longer inconvenience. And so can you tell me a little bit about when you started to fear death? Yeah, like I was a kid. I mean, as I said, as soon as I figured out that it was going to happen. Like, and how did you I, figure I, out that it was going to happen? Well, that's the thing is like, I, I must have been like four or five years old, so I can't really remember. Uh, it's hard for me to like to really get it to really remember what it was or how it felt because it was just so long ago and so i'm hearing you've carried this feeling with you for a long time yeah can you do you remember like times that maybe you were a little bit older that you were like worried about it like do you have any yeah. memories of being slightly older where yeah, I remember. Um, uh, well, it's like not just for me, right? I worry, obviously, about my parents dying. That's scary. And uh, there was one time my mom, she, uh, I don't know, we don't know really what it was. Uh, I took her to the doctor a while afterwards. But she like kind of had some sort of like a, it wasn't really like a heart attack, but it was some sort of like a thing. It was like a couple of steps below that. And I remember like I woke up and I thought that and I was like, oh, my God, that was a pretty bad point in my life because she didn't want me to call the, the ambulance. Right. Because we were really poor. We couldn't afford it. And like 
having to deal with that and like the helplessness, not only of, you know, of, of the, the greater existential situation, but also just like the day to day, like, you know, we don't have money, we can't take care of ourselves. And that was brutal. What was brutal about it? Well, I mean, like having to like feeling like you're going to lose one of your parents and then thinking to yourself, like, this is all I've ever known. And I like to know that it's not going to last. And like that, that's what was scary. And to, to be helpless, even inside of the context of society, right? Because you don't have the money to take care of it. And uh, the funny thing about that is that I actually... Um, like, yeah, I had, I remember because I, I woke up and she was like, like, she was like screaming or like crying. And so like, I had to wake up, like I used to have like PTSD and I guess it's PTSD. I, I don't know. I just kind of read about it later on. I would wake up and I would hear it in my head and I would have to get up and check on her. And this had happened like once every like two hours or something like that. And uh, this went on for maybe uh, like six months, a year, something like that. And, and then, uh, you know, I kind of got, I, 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 that stopped happening. I wouldn't say I got over it, but it stopped happening. And um, then uh, funny thing about that is that's actually what drove me to uh, to make my YouTube channel and to start making videos. Uh, that's kind of the reason. Can you help me understand that? How does that relate to a YouTube channel? Well, because I didn't have the uh, I, I couldn't really have a job at that point because I felt like I had to be around to take care of her. And I wanted to be able to work from home and do something like that. And so I didn't want to spend all day at work in case she had something happen that she needed me there for. And uh, that's why I started doing YouTube videos, because I thought that, well, maybe I can do this and, you know, see where it goes. That that's the reason. That's, a, that's interesting. Yeah. So are you saying that if your mom had never had something like a heart attack, you wouldn't you wouldn't have had a career in streaming uh you know I, uh, I i've always felt that yeah i mean that's why i say i never have any regrets in my life in a way and um it's like uh you know uh you need a hot fire to forge a sword and that's kind of the way that i i've looked at it yeah it's true but it sucks yeah So, well, Zach, this may sound kind of weird, but like, yeah. I'm kind of hearing that you're not really afraid of, I know it sounds weird. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you're not really afraid of death. I think what you're, what bothers you, it sounds to me, is actually your inability to deal with death. Well, control over it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it'd be nice if I could control it. That'd be great. I, I know it sounds weird, and, and, and yeah. this may seem like a, a, a useless distinction, but to me, it actually feels pretty significant because <laughs> what I'm what I'm hearing themes of is is not actually death. It's like it's like you being like and, and I'm I'm stretching here, okay? So I'm trying yeah, to yeah, draw yeah. connections, but um and so you know, we feel free to bat them down if they don't mm -hmm. sit with you. It's hypothesis testing. Um, you know, what I'm really hearing is that like, you've been on the receiving end of being powerless before. And like, oh, what, yeah. I, what I'm hearing is that death is like the guaranteed powerlessness. It's the one thing that you yeah. know, that no matter how hard you try, you can fix everything else. You can have money, you can have medical yep. care, you can have friends, you can have love, and you can gain power over every dimension in your life. But the one thing that you can never gain power over is death. Yeah. True. The interesting thing, though, is that I, I'm not, because it's, it, it's bizarre, because most people who fear death are concerned about regret. They're concerned about lost opportunities. They're concerned about all the things that they didn't get to do. I'm not hearing really much of that at all from you. If I could sit in my room and play video games, eating Cheetos and drinking soda for another thousand years, I would do it. So, so it's interesting because I, I know it sounds weird, but for a lot of people, the fear of death is about missed things. I'm not hearing that from you. What I'm really hearing from you is that death is about the inevitability of powerlessness. 
Yeah. Like that yeah, decay I mean, is like entropy is like a force that no matter how hard you fight against, you can never overcome. You can't you can't do anything about it. Yeah, it's the it's the Ozymandias analogy again. Yeah. Exactly. So, and so this is where like I think if you want to be free of that, the work that we need to do is about experiences of powerlessness in your life. Right. And because that's yeah. I, I've thought about doing that for myself too. It's like I remember um uh th there's like sometimes whenever I will take risks in a way, and this sounds really bad, uh, I'll take risks in a way that could really hurt me and I don't care about them because it's like kind of an exercise in letting go of worrying about your, your well-being. No, it's not. It's an exercise in exerting power. How, how, how do you feel? How do you feel like that? Cause like, like you're taking the risk, yeah. right? So like you're, you're manning up against it. Like it, the, the, like what, so this is exactly what I'm saying for most people risk to their well being is, is enough of a deterrent. But yeah. for you, you have like a, you have a far more important flame within you, which is like irrespective of the, the, like, the impact to my well-being, like, I'm going to choose. I'm going to be in control. I'm going to jump into the lake of fire because I'm the one that's doing it. And while a thousand people will say to you, you're a dumbass for jumping into a lake of fire, they don't understand that, like, what you need from that, what you're getting out of that, is that you're the one who's doing the jumping. For me, like, what I try to get out of it is that I can let go and just let it happen it, if, it, exactly. if it goes wrong. We're saying the same it, it, thing, yeah. So, right, because yeah, what I you're trying to do is train yourself to be powerless. Powerless. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Which, in a weird way, is actually taking control. Uh, I, I guess, yeah. I mean, if you, well, how can, well, yeah, but it's like it's how, how do you how can you? It's like a paradox, right? Because how do you take control of not having control? How, how yeah. do you not take control exactly. of not having? That's why it doesn't work. Okay. Because <laughs> you've tried it, right? Yeah. And you still fear death. And you still uh, fear yeah. powerlessness. And you've like, like, do you see, like, I think we're saying the same thing. Like, I think now I feel like we're onto something because it's like okay. you do this thing to train yourself, to inure yourself, to build, build some damage. Like you want some fear of death resistance. So what you're going to do is jump into a lake of fire and a thousand other people are going to say like, don't do that. That's dumb. And you're like, you guys yeah. don't understand. For me, it's like, I have to learn how to like, let go or whatever. Like I have to learn how to face these things and like do something that's high risk because it's like you trying to grapple with this thing. Yeah. Well, it's also just like small things. I remember I, uh, I was walking up the street. This was like a, a years ago, right? Or well, quite a while. I don't know if it was years ago. It was quite a while ago. And um, I had like a, a weird, I don't know if this was like a panic attack or something like that, where I was walking down to the street and I, or to the store, I was walking down the street to the store and I had like a weird thing happen with like my chest. And I don't know if it was a panic attack, if it was some sort of like, a, you know, weird thing with my heart. I don't know what it was. This happened a few years ago and I... It was the first time that I ever really felt, I think that almost many people have this experience, right? Where they, they have the, the first feeling of mortality. And, and that was that for me, right? And I remember a year or so later, I had not that same feeling, but something that reminded me of it, like walking up the street. And I thought to myself, if that's the case, and if I die right now, there couldn't be a better time for it to go. I'm walking down the street, I'm happy, I'm with my friends, I'm in my neighborhood, and everything is as good as it's ever going to be. And that's been the closest that I've been to being able to uh, deal with it. Yeah. Listen, what are you saying to me, Zach? Oh, I don't know. Like, like, think about that for a second. Like, yeah. what are you? So, so you're afraid of death, right? Yeah. In that second time when you were walking, don't read Twitch chat. <laughs> okay. All right. 
So when you're when you're walking up the street mm -hmm. and you start to feel that sensation, did you think you were dying? Uh, two percent chance, one percent chance. Yeah, it, it's a, it, it made me aware. It made me aware. Of sure. It. And so as like so, can we just sort of? I'm gonna put some. I'm gonna uh, interpret. Okay, so you're welcome to push yep. back against the interpretation. So in that moment, you were actually like. Some of the that's the closest to death that you've actually ever been. Closest to death that I've been without. I mean, like there have been some other times where I've been pretty close to it. Oh, uh, aware, aware of your proximity to death. Let's put it that way. Uh, I remember there was one time I was driving down. My friend was driving down the street. He was drunk and high and I was in the passenger seat and the seatbelt didn't work. And I thought to myself, Man, I'm never going to have to worry about that test that I have to do next week. <laughs> How did you there feel when you were close to death? Uh, in the first case, uh, the the one in the car, I felt uh, it's like it, there's like the te it's 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 terrifying, but at the same time, it's also grounding. And when you're walking up the street and you think to yourself, maybe there's a two percent chance this is a heart attack. Yeah. How do you feel? Uh, that, that I just, I felt good, felt fine. So, like, this makes no sense. Because here you are, afraid of death on yeah. a daily basis, and when it comes knocking on your door, the words that you describe are not abject terror. Sure, there's terror, but there's yeah. also grounding, and there's also a sense of, like, peace and acceptance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's It's a weird... It's like kind of you have moments of uh, moments of peace and, and moments of being able to deal with things, and then also moments where you can't. No, nope. it's like it, nope. it's not a, an even I'm keel. I'm gonna disagree. Okay. okay, because I think actually I know it sounds weird. What you say is yeah. logically makes a ton of sense. But here's yeah. here's what I'd like to put out to you: is that when actually faced with death, you're okay with it. It's the feeling of decay, the feeling of inevitability, the feeling of powerlessness about that future thing that you can never prevent. That's where you're yeah. terrified. Yeah, I, when, I think it's, yeah. Do you see the difference? Like, because when you actually face death, you're like, so be it. And anticipation is the uh, is the stressful thing. And, uh, you know, going back to the, the thing with the dentist, right? I mean, sitting in the waiting room is way more stressful than actually having the teeth, uh, you know, fixed or whatever. So now we get to like, I think the problem is that you've misdiagnosed yourself and not that we diagnose you here on stream. I'm of not going to diagnose or just use that term loosely. Okay. Yeah. Because you, you call it the fear of death, but I don't think it's the fear of death. I think it's the fear of powerlessness because when you actually face death, you're kind of like, if I go, so be it. That's Vairagya. Yeah. I mean, it, it's. It's scary in a way. Uh, yeah, I think the, the the more I have to think about it, it's like kind of, it, it, it's like I try not to think about it. <laughs> Let me just say that. Yeah, so we'll get to, to your whole coping structure in a yeah. second. But like, I, and I think this is where, you know, I, I sort of barked up the tree of like Roman Catholicism, fear of death yeah, and yeah. things like that. And that tree didn't, there's nothing in the tree, right? <laughs> I asked you that stuff and it kind of felt like it wasn't, you're yeah. kind of like, yeah, that's not the same feeling. You basically told me. So, and I think that makes sense because I think what the feeling really is, it, it really has to do with like, we've got to talk about times in your life where you felt powerless. Like this whole thing with your mom, I think is like a far better, like, I know it sounds kind of weird, but like, you know, when you think about your decay, when you do poorly in a video game, okay, yeah. this is going to sound like a bizarre question and feel free to swat this down too, if it doesn't feel right. Okay. When you do poorly in a video game, is the color, flavor, and texture of how you feel in that moment, forget about your thoughts, forget about your rationalizations, similar to how you felt when your mom told you, don't call the ambulance? Uh, yeah, I mean, to an extent, yeah, uh, sure. And I, I think that's basically it. It's like feeling, yeah, feeling like you don't have the control over it and like you just can't, you know what, you know what needs to happen and you can't do it. Yeah, so that's... So the, the interesting thing, as Zach, yeah. is that I think if you want to be happy, okay, 
which yeah, is yeah. a two-step process. And, and we can dig into this a little bit more if you want to today, but like, here's what I'm seeing. The first thing that you've got to do, because you said this beautifully, you said, I didn't get over it, but it stopped happening with your, well, with your, you I know, think what, that's a lot of ptsd and things like that right i mean you have like the initial shock it's the same with like a wound right i mean you the wound eventually heals but you still remember it being there in a way yeah so here's what i'm gonna say is that it just changed the shape in which it manifests and that it's the same thing this is the hypothesis the the fear of decay that you have is what it turned into uh, when, when did your mom have this event? 2012. Okay. I think it was, just, it was somewhere around that. I'm in 2013. I think it was uh, November 2012, if I remember right. And how long did it? Did you have the the PTSD waking up things like that? Uh, until about uh, I don't know, like 2014, 2000, middle of 2014, somewhere around there. Okay. I mean, like obviously these are very rough like guesses, but yeah. And, and how long have you felt not excited? How long have you been worried about the decay of your career and that you're getting old? Oh, uh, probably last two years, uh, two or three years. No, probably so three, three issues. So it looks like there's like, so let's say like there's a pretty significant gap between 2014 and 2018. Yeah. And, and I think that there's like, to, to me though, I, I feel like I've got a pretty good sense that if you want to be free of this thing, you've actually go to, got to go back and explore like times in your life where you felt powerless. Like the sense of inevitability and like powerlessness. Yeah. And we can kind of talk about that more. I mean, I know we've been at it for, you know, a while now. Um, and so I'll kind of leave it up to you whether you want to talk a little bit about like coping, like your, your uh, you know, your tendency to like cope. And well, what do you mean by exploring it? Like that's, I'm, I'm curious, like, how do you explore a moment yeah. of powerlessness? When, it, yeah, great question. So like, I, I think I know it sounds weird, but when, when I ask you about your mom, <laughs> what did you feel in that moment as you were retelling the story? Well, it sucked. I mean, like the thing is, if I, I, I've told the story before on my stream, so like kind of the visceral, like emotional feeling is not really there as much because I'm used to telling it, but, um, it's it it sucks. I mean, I think yeah, it's just it feels bad. I think that's what I, what in what way does it feel bad? I don't know. I mean, like it it, it feels bad that it happened. It feels bad that uh, I I guess yeah, it just feels bad that it happened. I, I I'm not really sure exactly how to describe it. So let me ask you this: Do you experience an echo of what you experienced back then when you tell the story? No, that's why I can tell it. Okay, so that's what we have to change. So here's how it works, okay? Mm -hmm. So from like, and this is a slightly more yogic perspective, but if we look at principles yeah. of psychotherapy, I think we're kind of, let's all, so I'll, I'll kind of explain to you what happens. So when we have negative experiences, there's a certain emotional energy that we experience in that moment. And yeah. that, that energy can do one of two things. It can either be digested or buried. Generally speaking, as we get older, we get better at digesting negative experiences. So if we think about like, you know, um, so for example, you know, being emotionally abused by your boss at the age of 27 for six months is far less damaging than being emotionally abused by a teacher for six months at the age of five. Yes. Yes. Right. So like if we think about why is that, it's because our, pro our our brain's capacity to process and digest at older ages is improved. Yeah. You have more context around it. Absolutely. Like you have more con. con yeah. So it, what you say is context is your brain's ability to attach context around it. Yeah. Right. So the five year old doesn't understand how to do that. Mm -hmm. You're precisely right. But I'm just sort of reshaping it as like a faculty of the mind. So if we yeah. look at like psychotherapy and like psychiatry, like why do we dig into the past? It's because like most of the dormant emotional energy forms in the past because we tend to do pretty good. Like you can have a traumatic breakup, you can lose a parent, things like that. But like losing a parent at the age of seven has, and I've seen this, lifelong impacts. 
Yeah. Losing a parent at the age of 42 has also affects you for the rest of your life, but it doesn't like damage you for the rest of your life. Yeah, it, it doesn't can. change the course. Yeah, I see. So here's what happens. I know it sounds kind of weird, but that energy lies dormant and then resurfaces. So the example that I'm going to use is like the, the standard one I use on stream is let's say I'm walking down the street with my kid and my kid mm -hmm. sees a dog. Kid goes to pet the dog. Kid dog kind of nips at my kid. The kid gets terrified, starts crying, yells, terrified, pick me up, daddy, feels a ton of fear and emotion. Ten minutes later, I get her an ice cream. She's licking the ice cream. We don't have to go to the emergency room or anything. The dog was actually just sniffing her, didn't even bite her. But for yeah. her, it was traumatic. And ten minutes later, she's like a kid. She's resilient. So she's like licking her ice cream, telling me about, you know, what she's, what she's doing in school. Everything's fine. Until the next day when she sees another dog. And she freaks out. Daddy, pick me up. Oh, my God. So, like, where did that, you know, she's like across the street. It's like, what's happening? So what's happened is her neurons have wired to recognize this dog as a dangerous stimulus. Yeah, people that, like the human brain is good at uh, recognizing patterns and making patterns. Absolutely. Right. So that dormant yeah. emotional energy. So that's the neuroscientific perspective. Let's think about it from like an emotional energy perspective. A ton of emotion disappears in 10 minutes it doesn't actually disappear right it goes dormant yeah, yeah yeah and then reactivates so what i'm hearing from you is that like this emotional energy reactivates as signs of decay oh you see the decay there you see the decay there it's inevitable i'm powerless yeah. there's nothing i can do and so then the question becomes like, okay, if that emotional energy is like manifesting, because this is where we kind of get to coping. You, I mean, you say it beautifully, Zach. You're kind of like, I didn't really get over it, but it sort of went away. And what it's doing is it's like seeping in through the cracks now. It shapes the way that your mind looks at things. It shapes the way that you look at life because there's this like part of your brain that is telling you, Zach, that no matter what you do, you are powerless. And so what is your brain, then what happens is your brain takes that feeling and it actually tries to construct a logic around it. So this sounds kind of weird, but this is how like kind of psychosis works. where like paranoia where the person has the paranoia. It's actually an emotion that's at the root of it. And then their, their mind constructs an explanation to corroborate the emotion. Why do people feel like they're being followed by the FBI as opposed to someone else? It's because they have a feeling of being followed, feeling, feeling observed, and then the mind constructs and asks itself in a logical way, what organizations have the resources to constantly follow me? Which is why you see these recurrent themes of like FBI, mob, whatever. Yeah, I can see that. So they're just looking for a outlet to rationalize their feelings. Absolutely. But at the root of it is a feeling. And in your case, yep. I think what your mind has done is like latched onto this fear of death because I don't think it's actually a fear of death. I know it sounds weird. I know you're afraid of death, but I think what you're really afraid of is powerlessness at the time of death. Because if we really look at it scientifically, when you face death, you're not like freaking the fuck out. You're actually like, if I have to go now, so be it, which is not what you would expect from someone who's facing death. No, it's not. And so I, I know it sounds kind of weird, but so now when we get to when you say like exploring it, what does that mean? What this means is that actually all of that dormant emotion, as we talk about it and as we bring the emotion up, you will feel it in the moment and you will feel powerless in the moment. But the cool thing is that each time you feel powerless, let's say like in a therapy session, it actually reduces the dormant emotional energy. And as the dormant emotional energy starts to wane, your fear of decay will go with it. So I actually have an interesting way that I actually, I, I, I agree with you. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons why I talked about it on my stream too, is because the exact same thing happened with uh, a lot of other problems that I had whenever I was younger. So if you ever go back and watch one of my highlight videos of 2016 or something like that, uh, I was very afraid to even show my arms because I'm, I'm extremely skinny. I'm very, very, very skinny. And um, I was even more so then. And uh, on top of that, I, I would always cover my mouth whenever I would smile because I didn't want people to see that I had uh, things wrong with my teeth. 
Um, I would wear a beanie sometimes if I felt a little bit more bald than usual that day. And uh, I had a lot of insecurities and um, having to eventually deal with those insecurities on camera. And I remember recently I took a shower on stream or I took my shirt off on stream. And imagine doing that uh, four years ago for me is just completely like I just could never imagine doing that at all. And I think that the reason that I was able to do that is kind of just consistently dealing with those problems and being faced with that constantly. And then slowly just kind of learning to accept that this is who I am rather than this is, uh, you know, something I have to be afraid of or ashamed of that I, I can't let anybody know about me. And I think that was that was helpful for me because it helped me become more of more accepting of myself. Yeah. So so perfect example. I'm going to yeah. reinterpret it using a different kind of language. So I think mm -hmm. the problem when we hear your story is people, if people are struggling with the same thing, they're like, I'm insecure about my appearance they're, And you yeah. say, I learned to accept it. Everyone listening at home is like, how do I learn to accept it? Right. Because acceptance comes at the end. Whereas like, I'm going to try to reinterpret this using the model that I shared with you is I don't think. I think the learning to accept it is sort of like happens towards the end. The interesting thing is that if you think about each of those moments, okay, so you have the, the dormant energy of insecurity and every time you put on the beanie, that energy is not being digested. But every time you take off the beanie, I know this sounds kind of weird, but that insecure emotion comes up and is present, alive and on in your mind. Yeah, and if it's not, I'll read Reddit and somebody will make a comment about it again. And so then it brings it up, and it brings it up, sure and it brings it up. So all of the dormant energy of the insecurity activates in the present. And if we think about even something like exposure therapy from a phobia, or we think about my kid, how do I get her to trust dogs again? How do I get her to like dogs? I have to bring up that emotion, right? It's like, oh, we're going to see oh, that dog's across the street. We're not going to touch it. Okay, daddy's going to go over and touch it. And that raises her anxiety a little bit. Yeah. And it's like, you know, do you want to touch it now? And she's like, no. And then it's like, okay. And then we're going to try again tomorrow. We're going to try again tomorrow. So it's the activation of that dormant energy in the present that when done with awareness, and this is a key part, which I think you were like grappling with yourself in those moments, right? And so that's like the awareness component. I'm sure yeah. you were. Uh, I mean, in a, in a way at the beginning, and I think also like to a certain extent, it's like I tried to be somebody that I wasn't. I tried to pretend like I was this different person. And I think that in a way, it's kind of like a negative emotion telling people that you're actually a degenerate with their teeth falling out. Like a, that's that's a negative emotion, but it, it's still you. It, it's still better to be you than pretend to be somebody else. But it, yeah, it, it's so, definitely not like I, I don't have like a better self image because of it. I, if anything, I have a worse self image. But it it, it is what it is. It's not so a it's it's not a facade. That is precisely so. Now now we're gonna kind of things full circle because that statement that you just made is moving yeah. in on that other axis that I'm talking about. Because oddly enough, like if we think about okay, my self image is poor. Let me fix my teeth. That's the axis of like climbing mountains, doing something external, becoming something that you're not. And what you're, what I'm hearing you say is that like, I actually accept that I kind of look like a degenerate and that actually brings me peace. Well, that's what's bad about it though, is because I'm okay with, with just living like an animal. Like I, I'm, I've said before, <laughs> no mere mortal can live with Asmongold. Like I, I live like an absolute animal and I don't care. Yeah. So now we get to subtle things. Yeah. There's another one. So this idea that you are an animal, that's a whole other complex that yeah. also has its origins, which like when you were growing up poor, just hypothesizing for a second, right? We could do yeah. this all day. But when you were growing up poor, like, tell me about what it was like to go to school. 
Oh, it would suck, right? I mean, like, uh, sometimes it would, especially if everybody else had X or Y thing and I didn't have it. Uh, yeah. Luckily, I mean, you know, my mom did, you know, it's not like we were, we weren't like the, we we didn't live in the projects, right? But we were one of the poorer families in a working class neighborhood, I would say somewhere around there, like lower working class neighborhood. And so, um, you know, there would be many times whenever I wouldn't have something that it felt like everybody else would have or I wouldn't be able to do something that everybody else could do or I couldn't look forward to something that everybody else could look forward to. And it did feel bad to be like that one person that didn't have it or that one person that couldn't do it or whatever. And I still think about that sometimes. It does. It, it's disappointing. But I guess like to me now, I just I always have like the uh, the perspective that, I, as I said, I don't really have any regrets. And I like in a way, I would, there'd be like small things that I would go back and I would want to change in my life. But I wouldn't really want to do a whole lot of that because every moment in my life has brought me to the point where I'm at now. And I think that I'm at a relatively good spot now. It's just that internally I'm not. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So this is where, you know, I could hypothesize further. I'm, I'm getting what you're saying. But but I, I think this sentiment of no mere mortal can live with Asmongold is, I think, a sentiment that was born. It, but I'm just taught, I, you know, just in the interest of time, I'm going to just toss stuff out. Is yeah, like yeah. that sentiment was born when you thought about inviting kids over to your house after you went with their house. That actually was born after I had a girlfriend live with me. Okay. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so well, the thing is, like a lot of my friends, like, and the thing is that back then uh, we were complete animals, like we all were. But the the thing is that they got older and they stopped being animals. But I'm just the fucking same. And like, I still feel like I'm 16. The only time I don't feel like I'm 16 or 13 anymore is if I talk to a 16 year old, then I realize, oh, fuck, okay, ne actually, never mind, I'm 30. But uh, outside of that, I feel the same pretty much. And I feel good. It's just that every the, the whole world around me changed. I didn't. I think there's a lot there. Yeah. Like, it's, it's a really interesting combination of acceptance and coping. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? it yeah, I, I think it's tough because I think what you've managed to do is like survive. And so a lot of what I'm hearing is like you've accepted yourself for who you are because rejecting yourself is too painful. But in, in accepting yourself for who you are, you're also propagating things that I think you know aren't good for you, which you're also working mm -hmm. on. No, yeah, that that's what the problem is, right? Is like I should not be okay with a number of things. Like I, I know that like internally, you know, my can, my head's fucked up in that way. Yeah. So to explain how you overcome that, you actually it's kind of weird. You have to go back to bringing up that negative emotion because as long as you say to yourself, "No mere mortal can live with Asmongold, gold," you're kind of yeah. laughing off the shamefulness of your situation. But I don't feel any shame. Exactly. That's the problem. Yeah. And and until you feel that shame, <laughs> right? So 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 like since you yeah. don't feel that shame, you're propagating the life because this is the way that you ignore the shame. Yeah, but it's like I just never had it. It never bothered me at all. And it, I I it's just it's so weird to me because like other people they will latch on and care so much about having this thing or having uh, you know, X or Y, uh, like object or something like that. And for me, I just don't care about any of it. It doesn't matter to me. Like, it doesn't matter if I have a nice car. It doesn't matter to me if I have a nice house. Uh, I don't need nice clothes. I wear the same clothes I wore in high school. Um, and that none of these things matter to me at all. Yeah, I, I just, so I don't care about the same things other people care about. I'm not sure how much of this is an acceptance and attachment and how much of it is a coping mechanism blown out of proportion when uh, I'm here, I, I could buy it if I want it. I just don't care. I, I understand that. Yeah. So, 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 you know, there are many reasons that people cannot care about something. Yeah. Right. They can learn to not care about it or they can be detached from it. Well, so what here's if, kind of, well, I, I think that there's a, there's another experience that kind of might shed some insight onto this. 
uh, whenever I was young, I uh, I did care about these things a lot. Uh, these they, they were very very meaningful to me. Like what I was saying before about having everything. Like you know, I wanted to have like nice clothes, a name brand clothes, things like that. And you know, many times my mom and I would go to the thrift store, and you know, I wouldn't be able to have like those same kinds of brand new clothes that. Uh, my other my other friends would have now many times I did also have nice clothes as well but it, it just wasn't really to the same degree and especially with other things that cost more money and I went to a school in high school initially where it was much more of like an upscale school many more people had you know that kind of stuff and I I kind of I, I didn't really fit in there and I realized that the people that were in that in that society that cared about those things were not like me. And uh, that kind of got me to not care about those things as much as I did then. Because I saw people that, you know, kind of attached themselves to those things and cared about those things a lot. And I looked at myself and I'm like, this is not who I am. That sounds to me like acceptance and growth. Uh, I would say so. I mean, I would hope so, at least. Yeah. So, so I'm not, I'm not detecting that this is some weird coping mechanism in terms of like being not materialistic. Ironically, yeah. if we look at your karmic temperament, mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because I think b being born. So, so what you just described, Asmund Gold, so <laughs> is actually would be interpreted by some of my teachers as a sign of past spiritual work. So that there, there's a certain, so it's interesting because like in, in the Hindu gaming system or Buddhist, uh, less so of the Buddhist, but more, more in the Hindu, um, that essentially like you don't carry over your gear, you don't carry over your stats, but you carry over your XP between incarnations. And what you're yeah. describing to me is, is a generally non-materialistic sentiment, which would be interpreted by some of my teachers as a sign of past spiritual work. Which, yeah, oddly we, enough, we, is oftentimes coupled with uh, a lot of material success. And is sort of the formula. This is why, like, Buddha was sort of the same way, too. And he was born as a prince. So his karma <laughs> was like spawn, like picking a spawn point where you can continue to grow spiritually. And you carry some of your XP with you. So this is something that I've just seen time and again. I don't know if this is like a bias on my part where I'm looking for it, yeah. so therefore I find it. But I oftentimes find that people who are not very materialistic and are quite materialistically successful and unhappy despite their materialistic success wind up in conversations with me. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I think that's the reason why. Yeah, I, 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 of course, that makes sense. Now, just to kind of, uh, I'm going to try to close the loop and maybe wrap things up and give yeah. you a direction to go. Does that sound okay to you? Or would you like to kind of, okay. Um, so I think going forward, Zach, if I had to make one recommendation for you, it yeah. would be to really explore this theme of powerlessness in your life. And so like, have there been times or moments where you felt that inevitability of decay? And I, I recognize that it manifests in gaming and in your life, but I, I, I'd really think about these moments like when you couldn't call an ambulance, like that's perfect. That that's exactly good. what we're talking about, right? There's a sense of like, there is no matter how hard you try and what you do, there, like, you know, there's nothing. No amount of your effort will succeed. And as you track back and discover those moments in your life, I, I know you've tried to jump in for twice now. Um, as you track back and try to find those moments in your life, and as you actually, if you can evoke that feeling of powerlessness in the present, my hypothesis is that your fear of decay will go with it. So how do, how do I evoke a moment of powerlessness without having control over the powerlessness, making the paradox, making mean it, mean that it's irrelevant? Because like uh, if you yeah that that's what's confusing to me like how, how do you memory yeah so 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 the way you evoke the feeling is because the the dormant the emotion is going to be dormant so the problem yeah. is that like like you have you ever worked with a therapist by the way never so I think if you wanted to see a therapist I think this is what you could work on with someone so like you're going to go yeah. in week after week after week. And you're going to talk about these experiences. And if you find a decent therapist, they're going to find ways to ask you questions 
<laughs> that are going to evoke emotion. Because I don't know if you can tell, but over the course of this entire conversation, we keep on moving away from emotion by talking intellectually and philosophically. Well, how do you talk in terms of emotion? Because like for me, I, I just... The emotions are there. Yeah. I mean, it made me feel bad. I don't really know exactly how much more I can describe about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not think a very, about, yeah. Let me think about whether, so I can't tell you the answer to that question. I have to show you. Okay. Because telling you the answer to the question is operating on an intellectual level and moving in the opposite direction that we need to. Yeah. It, it's like even, yeah, talking about it makes it irrelevant in a way. Yeah, so I think it's like it's like slow conversations where, you know, sometimes when I interview people, like emotions come out. I think you have a, a interesting natural damage resistance from being on the road to enlightenment. And then you have an additional coping mechanism, which sort of like suppresses and buries some of those emotions. The third thing that could be going on is that these circuits of your brain are suppressed by playing video games. Yeah, I mean, there's there's part of that. I mean, I, I think that it's also like I I don't want to let go of things that I, I had. I think that's definitely what it is. I'm very attached to things that I had. And, you know, I remember I, I saw a, a friend of, of mine. I'd never seen this guy. I haven't seen this guy since like high school. And it was the day before I came back to streaming like last year, I think. And I remember I talked to him and this is going to sound absolutely degenerate and that's because it is but i always told the story of a friend of mine who drew a, a female dragon masturbating on a chalkboard on the first day of school and he was the guy that did that and i mentioned it to him and he remembered it and that meant so much to me because nobody else in the whole world knew, thought that fucking was thought that shit was true <laughs> nobody else thought that was true and i remember seeing him and like i drove home and i cried in the car because i got a chance to to remember that it was real. You know, this sounds weird, uh, mm -hmm. Zach, but like, I don't know exactly where that story comes from, but what I'm hearing from you is the way to do what I'm telling you to do. Wait, it, and, and it wasn't just like that moment. That moment is just like one thing, right? But it was like everything about that, you know, the life that we lived, uh, just everything. It was great. I, I give anything to go back there. I would. What are you feeling now? That was half my life ago. I feel like it wasn't. Like it, it feels like it was the the. I mean, obviously, it was feel it was a while ago now, unfortunately. But um, it felt uh. It it just sucks, man. You can never go back. So I, I could see emotion coming up. Yeah. And you got to watch out for, for Twitch chat because they're going to bury it. Right. So. Oh, yeah. So so like like something came up there. You shared a story. Yeah. And then you felt emotion. Yeah, I do. Buried. It's gone now. You see that? Yeah. I mean, I've never really been a particularly emotional person. Yep. I feel like any time that I show my emotions, it's not good. They're mostly bad. Mostly yep. bad emotions. Yeah. So I think we've got to teach you how to let that stuff out. And I, I, when I said I, I wasn't optimistic, but I think you just did it. Yeah. Right? And it's weird. But like, as you told that story, like I, we were just talking about something, you tell this story about, you know, a friend of yours who drew... A picture of I, I want to really emphasize because it sounds fucking weird that it was not really about the moment itself it's what the moment represented uh, and all the justifications cool? in the world yeah. are going to move away from the emotion the, the yeah, thing, yeah. you don't have to justify anything this is just like I, I don't know why but you just did it when you ask me how do I yeah. do it I don't know you just did and this is what I, I it's, it's weird it's just you have to go back to the memory and like something about sharing that with him in that moment for things that you had started to doubt and push away and buried came up and it's painful, but it's cathartic. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So it's you like just, I, I never thought I'd see him again. 
Yeah. I, yeah. I never thought it would happen. So there are all kinds of interpretations we can make there. Like, yeah. so for example, the power of that moment is something that you thought was inevitable became not inevitable. Exactly. That you would never get closure. And so we can see how that's powerful for you because like, what's your problem? It's that the inevitable is inevitable. And here's a, here's a chance. Here's a moment where that doesn't have to be the case. And it's, it's like painful, but it's also hopeful. Okay. I can see that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's an interpretation, but that also is like me going intellectually. Like, I don't know if that's actually fucking true or not. The, yeah, the point, like, though, is I don't know what you just did, but you need to do more of it. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I don't know. It just sucks. Like, it, it it's sad because, like, I used to. I, I used to be, like, really happy about that kind of shit. And now I don't really have that same experience anymore. And I don't know, like, I, and I feel like I can never have that back because it was uh, the context of my life, you know? It's like my, my parents were healthy. I didn't have to worry about a job. Uh, I didn't have to worry about a bunch of other weird bullshit. It was just me and the boys hanging out all the time, drawing dragons on a chalkboard and, you know, riding the bus home together, singing along to rap songs. And that was good. It really was good. How are your parents back? Could be better. Could be worse. They're all right. Doesn't sound like they're all right. Uh, well, the thing is, it, it, there's a degree of all right. It's kind of like. A, so you're okay, pivoting uh, away. You're going down the wrong side of the mountain. Well, let me let me explain what I'm saying. Right. Is like a, <laughs> what I was saying before about how like things get worse so slowly that you don't realize that they're happening. And then you slowly just accept how, how bad that they are. Yeah. There's a day that my mom started using a cane to walk around. That was really painful for me to see. And it really hurt me a lot. But because it's happened for like now for a while, I don't feel the same level of Im like visceral reaction whenever I see her doing it now. What was because it like I, to I, see your mom walk with a cane for the first time? I, I, it was terrible. It's horrible. What was terrible about it? Uh, it's like, it's one step down, down that mountain, you know, or a number of steps. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like a really emotional feeling, I guess. It was just like, kind of, oh, fuck. Like, I, it was just, I, I don't know. I, I can't really even describe it. So I, I think, Zach, this is going to take some work, right? So, so oh, yeah. I, I think, um, but I, I do still feel optimistic that like, there are too many things here that seem quite familiar to me that I've seen end in a good place. Well, that's good. No, that, and, that, that's, that's a relief. Right. So, so I, I think part of the issue here is that as you, as you say, I can't describe it. So like, yeah, I'd have Once to throw like yeah, and that's the problem is like it's it's not about thinking about it. Like I don't know cuz cuz thinking about it isn't the right thing. I'm going to go back to the, you know, the the dragon on the chalkboard as an example. Yeah. There are certain ways, there are like shortcuts, level skips. Mm -hmm. And like something about that story was like the secret tunnel at the end of the Mario Brothers level that warps you to wor world 4. And it's not yeah. a logical chain, and you can logically chain it out as much as you want to, and that's not going to be that effective. Mm -hmm. The real thing is digging around for those level skips. And when you had that level skip, the emotion came right up. Like, it was like, I mean, I think everyone saw it. Like, you were at the verge of tears. And Yeah, and it's sad. Because, like, I, you, you can just for a moment go back. You can just for a moment go back and realize how good it used to be. So I'm also hearing themes of not just power and uh, powerlessness and inevitability, but of loss. Right? Uh, like, yeah, yeah, I would say so. And, and so that's also worth digging into. I think, uh, you know, Zach, of all the people that we've talked to on stream, I, I would strongly recommend that you 
really think about finding someone to do this kind of work? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I try to, uh, I try not to think about it as much as I can. And maybe, maybe I should try to think about it more. Yeah. So maybe thinking about it isn't the right move. Working on it. But by all means, think about it. I think it's, it's your, yeah. you know, I don't know if you play D and D, but you've got an 18 on int. Well, thanks. But this is where, this is where like, I don't know what your wisdom is, right? Like there's some other dimension of your being, which I think you over rationalize, intellectualize and philosophize to get away from your kind of like emotional stuff. But I, you know, if you want to think about it, by all means, go for it. Well, right? yeah, it's just like it's like you, you spend time with yourself processing it. It's like you, you'll lay yeah. in bed like a lot of times I'll, I'll lay in bed without even no music, not on my phone. And I'll just kind of experience myself, you know, it's like a form of, I, I guess, like uh, uh, uncultured medita meditation. <laughs> yeah. Uncultured. Yeah, I think yeah. it's it's um it's interesting to see. Yeah. Um, how unrefined do you think you are? Uh yeah, I mean it's I mean there are a lot of techniques and things like that you can deal with, but it's hard to it, it's <laughs> sorry, I was just thinking I was thinking of something. Um I uh there are a lot of techniques that you can use and it's hard to really know what works and what doesn't, of course. Yep. And that's why I would encourage you to seek guidance from someone who's yeah. maybe a little bit more experienced and who can show you what the right technique is. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I've thought about like, I, I try to like I, a lot of times I would try to like watch videos about like video games and stuff like that. And this is kind of not really the same thing, but it's kind of the same type of idea of like bettering yourself. And, and nowadays I will always try to watch videos and, and do things and, and uh, read about things that kind of matter, I guess, to an extent like history and, you know, uh, mathematics and stuff like that. And I've tried to learn more and, and be a better version of myself. Just so I can I can process things better and, and, and think and have the ability to have that that knowledge. Uh, like for, for me, I, I I'm lucky in a way that I have a very good memory, but I waste that memory on remembering video games. Yeah, I'm getting all kinds of weird signals from you. I know. Um I don't mean that to be judgmental, but it, it's just it feels like we're opening up new and new avenues of conversation because now That's I have right. questions like, are you proud of yourself or are other people proud of you? Other yeah. people are. Are you proud of yourself? I've done some good things. It's all right. Could be better. It always can be better. So. That's a no. Um, I, I think that I, it's like, I'd say it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it, it, let me tell you what that is. That's yeah. a no cloaked in coping and positivity. Well, it's like, I mean, no, it, it's a no, it's in, it's an intellectualized no, because like I've, I've succeeded in a number of things on a very, uh, on a very real level, right? Like I, I've, I've done this, I've done that. I've succeeded at this. I've succeeded at that. Like all of these things are things that I'm proud of, but at the same time, I feel like I could do more or I, I'm not living up to what potential that I have in my own mind. The question yeah. isn't whether you've done things that you can be proud of. The question is, are you proud of yourself? Um, hmm. I don't know. It's an interesting question. I, I don't, I don't know. Like I, I would obviously like the first thing that I would say is is no and yes, because I've been very happy you know in a lot of ways like hanging out with my friends like doing what I want to do etc. But is that something to be proud of? Do you do you have to be proud of yourself to be fulfilled? 
Yeah. So, because like a lot of the sense of pride is like a pride in general, like a, in this case, to some degree, is like a construct that exists in context of society. So, like, do I am I proud of, you know, these accomplishments that I've had in real life? Well, yes, to an extent, but these accomplishments that I have in real life are these are constructs that exist in society. These are not things that are internal. These are not, uh, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So when I ask you a question about whether you have pride in yourself, yeah, how do you answer? Well, that the answer is, is very simple. I don't know. And, and like, I'm proud of some things I'm not of others. I think that's probably, and it's a shit answer. A hundred percent. It's a shit answer, but like, there it is. Yeah. So I, I, I think we're, I'm sort of feeling like, I, I don't know that we're going to get to somewhere very productive from this conversation. I think that these are all important conversations. No, I'm okay. sort of taxed yeah. at this point. Um, I feel like I'm oom. Um. Yeah. I, I'm probably go away down afterwards. Uh, and so what I would say to you, Zach, is that like when I ask you a question about your feelings, your answer appears to be philosophical or intellectual in nature. You start talking about constructs in society, whereas what I'm at, like pride is an emotion. Right? Well, the Shame emotion is an emotion. Uh, I mean, aren't they the same thing? What? Intellectual well, like it, constructs in yeah, society yeah. and pride? No. Well, yeah, I think so. Like, I mean, in, in a way, right? Because you have like shame... And like, so if you are ashamed of um, not having a nice car or something like that, that's completely a society construct. That's, some, that's not something that really means a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. Doesn't really mean a lot as a person, doesn't make you grow as a person. This just exists as a thing that you do to make society want to, to care about you. No. Okay. So shame is a subjective experience. Can shame be caused by certain societal things? Absolutely. But shame is within. Right? So like, for example, depending on the societal construct, I can be ashamed of my skin color or my mm -hmm. grades or the clothes that I wear. Completely agree. But the experience of shame for those five people, depending on the societal constructs, is still subjective. It's an experience of emotion. Is it triggered by societal constructs? Do societal constructs yeah. have something to do with it? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, like anger or emotion is not a societal construct. A a emotion can be triggered by a societal construct. Sure. Do, do, are certain people's neurons wired to elicit particular emotions based on certain societal constructs? Absolutely. Yeah. But fundamentally, I think what I'm hearing from you is that when we go towards emotion, your mind interprets, intellectualizes, rationalizes. And if we think about the story of the chalkboard, there's no yeah. interpretation there. It's just raw emotion. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of context behind it, of sure, course. I mean, sure. like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's but, a lot of like actual like, things that happened. Yeah, but like like concepts in the mind are of fundamentally different stuff than emotions in the mind. It's like woodworking and like you know alchemy, like okay. it's different stuff, different mats. Yeah. And, and what I find is that you tend to always go towards the intellectualization, the philosophization, which I think is absolutely one of your strengths, one of your coping mechanisms, and one of the ways that your neurons is wired. And that I think that you're going to gain a lot. Like, I don't think you're going to be able to logic your way out of the fear of decay, which is really what I'd call it. It's not death. It's like the, yeah. the powerlessness and inevitability. Or maybe you can, actually. You can. But I think that you're going to get far better results by learning, like picking up a different secondary skill on your WoW character, because, you know, you can try to, you can chug potions to increase all your stats, but at some point it's just more efficient to craft yourself some armor and put that shit on. And what yeah. I'm hearing is that you're a grandmaster potion maker who's trying to make potions instead of wearing armor. 
Yeah, I mean, I I could see that. Sure, I I. I... I, I think for me, like there have been emotions like shame and things like that, that I've had to overcome. And like, you know, I said about going to, to that school and then feeling ashamed of myself. And so I've gotten through some of those things for sure. But uh, some other ones, not as much. Yeah. So I, I think it's just a new skill that you can learn. Yeah. And, um, you, you know, I, I think if you have questions or more, you know, if you want more detailed information about that, like. I, I feel kind of spent at the moment, so oh, I don't know, but but I'd say that, yeah. you know, feel free to like sleep on it or I need to sleep yeah. on it. And if you're kind of curious about that or want to learn more, just, you know, mm -hmm. ping us. I think generally speaking, when people come on stream, I think we'll send you like a packet of information about yeah. potentially like put options for follow up and how to find a therapist and things like that, if you're curious mm -hmm. about that. But um, overall, I, I, I think... You know, I, I really can, I feel like I understand a lot of what you're going through and I don't think it is quite as inevitable and I think it's, I, I think it's solvable. I think you're walking a difficult road, but it's a road that many people have walked before and you seem to have a lot of the karmic signs that other people who have walked this road have walked. Okay. All a right. A tendency That's... for not being materialistic a lot of worldly success early in life and a sense of dissatisfaction. That's the spiritual road. And laying on top of that, that I think you're going to have to process is more of like a neuronal psychological, like fear of decay and inevitability and, and being powerless in the face of certain things, which if we really think about it, sounds like the fear of death, but the more that we tunnel into it, we actually discover that when faced with death, you're a Chad, you know, yeah. and, and and so like as terrifying as that is like you actually know how to accept you know how to accept parts of yourself you know how to face that actually um with some degree of terror and grounding yeah there were a number of times when i was younger i would do things that would get me pretty close to it or pretty close to at least a lot of material harm yeah that yeah is another thing that I find myself being curious about, but don't think I have the mana for the encounter. Oh, don't worry. If you did, I wouldn't cast a spell. <laughs> uh, Zach, are you okay with our conversation today? Yeah, I'm great. I, I really appreciate you bringing me on and talking about it. I, I, I hope that, you know, I talk about these things and the reason why I come on is I think that the idea of this is that I, I think it's important to have people put themselves out there and, and show that this kind of stuff like mental health and just to a greater extent, being able to talk about your problems. And I think people will watch what I say and then they will relate to it and that will help them. So even if it might make me look weird or look bad, the greater good for it is worth it. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, do you think you look bad? I think so. I think any time that a person reveals their emotions at all, uh, there are a lot of people that um, that resent that. Do you think you look bad? No. Okay. I don't think you look bad at all. Thank you. I think you're quite handsome. <laughs> well, at least that's one of us, right? <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, Zach, thank you very much. Um, you know, I hope you f have fun playing Burning Crusade. Yeah, me too. Uh, I, I yeah. hope you get more enjoyment out of New World in three days. I'm yeah. certainly looking forward to it. Um, really? I was anyway. Yeah. And then, I, and then uh, yeah. Go ahead. Maybe once you find inner peace, you can start developing games for the rest of us. Uh, yeah, I've never been... I like the idea of making games sometimes, but... I took a coding class and it didn't go too well. So I think I'd have to be the idea guy there, the vision sure. person. Sure. <laughs> so we'll see. All right. Thanks yeah, a lot, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And uh, I'll talk to you later. See ya. All right. See ya. Peace. Um, let's. Okay. Chat. That was, that was fun. That was great. You know, I, I think Zach is fantastic, man. Such a good dude.